TV. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, Bradford seminar this semester. Uh, I'm Alex Glaser, uh, part of CIPRI and part of SPIA, and it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker to you today, Andrea Ramana, who uh, holds the Simons Chair in um, Disarmament, Global and uh, Human Security at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and he is also a professor of public policy and uh, global affairs. Rama and I will be visiting uh, Princeton uh, this uh, spring. Uh, he's part of our group, uh, the Program on Science and Global Security, uh, which, by the way, uh, I guess Ramana was part of our team for at, yeah, maybe around 14, 15, 15 14 years uh, in uh, earlier times. Uh, and at the time, I think we started to work together on uh, you know, SMRs. And uh, so we're going to learn uh, more about that uh, today. Um, I do also want to mention that Ramana will be teaching a half-term course after spring uh, break. Uh, the title is Energy, Environment, Development, and Justice uh, for the students. Uh, this will be SPIA 594W. I think there's still a few slots left. Um, so you heard it here uh, first, perhaps. Uh, Ramana has uh, won many awards. Uh, among them, uh, he was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2003. He was an APS uh, Leo Zillard winner in 2014, I believe, together with uh, Rajaraman. Zia. With Rajaraman. Oh, with Rajaraman. Oh, yeah? yeah. Together with Raja Raman. Yes, okay. <laughs> Zia there was another Zia. award. I'm getting confused about the awards. In any event, um, it's great to have you uh, here. Uh, Raman has a PhD in physics and will hear you know, everything. Uh, today, you ever always want to know about SMRs. Over to you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I have another book coming out. I'll just plug it. It's called Nuclear is Not the Solution, The Folly of Atomic Power in an Age of Climate Change. Um, thank you very much for this uh, invitation to be here. And it's an honor to be leading off the speaking of the series. Um, I have attended many talks here in this room. and so. It's a pleasure to be here. Now I have to figure out how I can move these things. OK. So um, I'll jump straight in to the talk. Um, if you have heard anything about nuclear energy, if you follow the news, you would have heard of this term called small modular reactors. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. But it's all over the news, and all kinds of people are threatening to be building these things. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I'll just start very briefly by talking about uh, you know, what these small modular uh, nuclear reactors are and uh, why there is actually a lot of talk about it. Uh, and then uh, try to offer a kind of uh, reality check. And then also talk a little bit more from the um, STS, the Science Technology Society kind of perspective about why there are these claims. Uh, so thinking about the sociology of it. Uh, towards the end. So uh, a while ago, I used to use this cartoon a lot. But uh, after Scott Adams got pulled off for his sort of racist remarks, I'm a little hesitant to use it. Uh, but basically, small modular reactors, I think this captures it quite uh, uh, effectively. These are basically paper designs of uh, nuclear reactors. Um, and there are sort of two terms in that small and modular. Reactors, hopefully all of you understand. It's a nuclear reactor. Uh, the small is, a, uh, is uh, specifies the energy output, the electricity out, uh, output, the design output of these things. By definition, anything under 300 megawatts is considered to be small. Uh, between 300 and 700 is called medium. Conventionally, the reactors that we are building these days are typically of the order of 1,000 to 1,500 megawatts. So these are like about a factor of three to five smaller, or even much smaller. Physically, they could be small or large. That depends on the design. There are a large number of different kinds of uh, nuclear reactor designs that get lumped under the term small modular reactor. And depending on the design, depending on the technical characteristics, they could be physically larger or smaller. And this little picture here shows the physical size of one particular thing, the height of the reactor pressure vessel, and you can see it varies quite a lot. The other term uh, is this term modular. And uh, there are sort of two meanings for the word modular. Uh, but the one that I think is more pertinent 
is um, that the reactor is not supposed to be constructed on site uh, from scratch, but uh, there are factory made modules that go to the site and they are put together. So I used to say sort of like Lego blocks, and then I would always feel a little like, you know, am I caricaturing them? Then I found this uh, video of the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission in France using exactly those Lego blocks to construct his reactor. So I think it's safe to use it to say that. Uh, but that's exactly what they sort of think about. And I'll talk about the importance of that uh, claim about modularity for some of the other claims that uh, developers of these designs make. Um, so, so, but, but modular construction is something which is common. You know, today, if you want to think about a building that's being built out here, nobody sort of brings bricks and sort of puts them out. You, know, right? you bring big uh, you know, doors and windows and uh, wall panels built in a factory to put together your building. The same idea in a nuclear reactor as well, except that, of course, these reactor components are much more demanding in terms of the technical specifications of what you can put together. So there's a lot of uh, challenges there. So why uh, small modular reactors? To sort of understand that, I'll give you a very, very brief overview of where uh, the uh, nuclear energy uh, figures in our current electricity supply uh, thing. So the first thing which I want to mention is that uh, nuclear reactor construction, the best days of it are long over. Uh, they're sort of, if you look at the fleet of nuclear reactors around the world, they were primarily built in two big waves. You can roughly think of the 1970s waves as the one that made most of the reactors in the United States, and the 80s wave as the one that is in Western Europe. Of course, it's global, but I'm just giving you a sort of uh, simplified picture. And then there's a fairly sharp drop in the mid 80s. So the highest uh, rates of nuclear construction were in 1984 and 1985. There were about 33 reactors that were connected to the grid each of those years. After that, there's a very sharp drop off. And there are multiple reasons for it. But if you want to think about timing, 1986 was the year of the Chernobyl uh, nuclear accident. Right? I'm not saying that is a cause and effect. I'm just giving you a sort of temporal idea. 1979 was the Three Mile Island accident. But a lot of this for, are, are for reasons which I'm going to get to later. I don't think they have to do with accidents. Ever since then, you see in many years, there are many more nuclear reactors that are shut down than started up. The net effect of this sort of pattern of very low rates of construction, as well as uh, uh, nuclear reactors being shut down, is that the number of nuclear reactors around the world and the capacity of nuclear energy, the power capacity, has been more or less flat for a more than two decades at this point. So uh, as of uh, uh, earlier, uh, early, um, the middle of last year, uh, there were a little over 400 reactors that were operating, 497 reactors to be precise. Uh, and this is sort of, these are many of the, uh, much of the data that I'll be presenting on sort of nuclear energy is uh, drawn from something called the World Nuclear Industry Status Report that I'm one of the contributors to. Uh, but they have been uh, tracking the nuclear industry and how it actually is performing for about 15 years at this point. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. The, the second effect of the fact that there are few reactors being constructed is that the share of electricity around the world uh, around, that is running in the world's electricity grids produced by nuclear reactors has been declining continuously since the mid-1990s. Uh, the maximum it ever was was in the it was 1996, it was about 17.5%. Uh, in 2022, it was 9.2%. Right? And just to put that in perspective, uh, modern renewables, which is mostly wind and solar with some biomass and so on, is at 14.2%. This is data from the what used to be the BP Energy uh, Review, and now is the Energy Institute. OK, why is this trend? I think the simplest answer is that Nuclear energy is just not economically competitive. And in turn, that's because nuclear reactors cost a lot to build. And in turn, I would say the reason why nuclear reactors are expensive, and they will be expensive always, is because nuclear power is basically, nuclear reactors basically a very complicated way to boil water. And you're using a very hazardous process. So it has to be controlled. You have to make sure there's no radioactive materials coming out. And that's not an easy task. So there is no way that you can actually build a cheap nuclear reactor. right? That is, of course, does mean that it's not going to be a big source of energy and so on. We'll get to that. But this is going to be a fundamental fact, which you cannot sort of escape. What has been changing, though, uh, is that 
uh, if you look at uh, other kinds of power, uh, they have, in particular renewables, they have been declining very sharply. Right? Uh, in the old days, when the first round of nuclear reactors were built, the primary competition was with fossil fuels, primarily with coal. These days, because of climate change, there's not a lot of construction of coal, and we would like to shut down whatever is there. So the real competition is with renewables. And if you look at the com uh, comparison with renewables, they have been falling very fast and are now among the cheapest source of electricity uh, in many, many parts of the world. This is data from uh, this uh, Wall Street company called Lazard that, that uh, every, every year or so brings out a report on the different uh, uh, costs of different kinds of uh, energy technologies in the United States. So they look at a large number of projects. Now, the nuclear thing, as you can see, is not just not, not only the highest, but it's also climbed a lot. Uh, and I'll sort of talk a little bit more about that later. The, till about a decade ago, um, this, the nuclear industry's response to this would be to say, yes, we know nuclear reactors cost a lot to build, but they are actually cheap to operate because you can produce a lot of power with just a little bit of uranium, and so the cost of fueling it is fairly low. Uh, in comparison to coal and natural gas plants where you have to buy the coal or the natural gas. And so in the long run, you're going to make money. And that story became unstuck about a decade ago. And you started seeing a number of older nuclear plants being shut down for economic reasons. Uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, striking of those was uh, in Vermont, Vermont Yankee, where the Entergy Corporation uh, had a conflict with the a state of Vermont, a case that went up all the way to the Supreme Court about the right of the state to actually regulate this older <coughs> reactor. The Vermonters wanted to shut down the reactor because they thought it was unsafe. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said, no, no, no. Uh, it's only we who have the uh, federal uh, right to dis decide whether a reactor is uh, safe or not. And you guys don't have the jurisdiction to decide on this. The Supreme Court voted in favor of the, NR uh, of the NRC. But like a few months after that, Entergy basically said, OK, we won that case, but you're going to shut down the reactor anyway, because it doesn't make us any money. Um, and so this is, it's not just in the United States. It's been happening in, in Western Europe as well, basically anywhere where uh, the uh, nuclear power is sort of exposed to the market. Uh, and subsequently, what we have seen is that the few reactors that were constructed, and I'll talk about this more, uh, have all risen in cost. This is also a long-standing trend with uh, nuclear reactors. But the most recent reactors that are being constructed in the United States, for example, in France, uh, in, the, uh, in the UK, the one that's being constructed, these have all been extremely expensive and extremely more over budget and well, uh, much more delayed than even historical patterns. But historically, if you one study that looked at 180 different projects, nuclear reactor projects, found that 97% uh, of them had exceeded budget, uh, on average by about $1.3 billion, uh, which were all about 117% higher, and they were all about 64% uh, over time. Um, and we are seeing that sort of in a more um, exaggerated fashion or intense fashion in the most react uh, new newest reactors. So this is the context in which sort of small modular reactors are sort of being uh, proposed as a way for the nuclear industry to continue to say, you know, we are still part of the game, right? And we can come up with this new generation of reactors that are going to fix all these problems, right? And um, the term that I learned from somebody who used to work for the NRC as a consultant and who came to our program to give a seminar was happy talk, right? And this is how this is kind of the 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 marketing slogans that these people uh, talk about. And so some of the happy talk that you'll see from uh, nuclear uh, reactor vendors, small modular reactor vendors, is that these are simple reactors, right? And as I've sort of already warned you against, the idea of simple reactor doesn't really make any sense. Uh, it just sort of makes it look smaller, doesn't mean that it's actually simple. Uh, that they are safe, right? And I'm going to come back to all of these things. Uh, that uh, they don't contribute to nuclear weapons proliferation that they will go to sort of new markets, smaller markets, uh, for other kinds of purposes. Uh, they could be, in principle, put on ships or barges or submarines and things of that sort. Uh, and most important, that they're going to be cheap. right? 
And so this is uh, an advertisement from NewScale, and I will talk more about NewScale uh, later on. And another sort of uh, selling point for some designs is that they're going to produce less uh, radioactive waste. So the uh, question is, are these claims likely to be realized? And Zia was sitting there, and I looked at a whole bunch of designs. And uh, what we sort of, uh, I mean, a common sense point which you will understand is that if you're making a claim about a, a nuclear reactor, that claim has to be uh, coded in some technical aspect of the design. right? So if you have to produce less radioactive waste, you have to operate in what we call the fast spectrum, using high energy neutrons. Uh, a, compared to a thermal reactor, a fast, spectron, a fast spectrum reactor will fission more of the, uh, of the transuranic elements. And for a variety of reasons, it can produce less waste. Right? But what we realize is that once you do that, that is going to have consequences for other desirable things. So um, what we sort of looked at were four particular challenges that had been identified by many people about nuclear power and uh, sort of um, stated by a very influential report from the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, in 2003, where they said there are four major challenges, cost, safety, uh, waste, and proliferation. Right? And what we tried to see was, how would each of these things uh, be influenced in small modular reactors? And we decided that you know, none, no design can actually solve all those four problems simultaneously. Right? You cannot reduce waste and also uh, make it safety. For example, a smaller reactor uh, will, uh, might have some safety benefits. I'll come to, come to that. But even a small reactor, Alex and I sort of, Alex mostly, uh, did the calculations to show that a smaller reactor would actually produce more, uh, will require more uranium, uh, all else being equal, compared to a large reactor, uh, and will, in, in any case, produce enough uh, plutonium or require enough uh, enrichment capacity to be able to make a fairly large number of nuclear weapons. So even a, a reactor that's small for electricity generation purposes can be large when you're thinking about nuclear weapons capability. More importantly, a small reactor means that uh, you are going to lose out on what are called economies of scale. So a larger reactor, let's say one that produces five times as much electricity, will not require five times as much concrete, or will not need five times as many workers. So the cost per unit of uh, power capacity or power production are going to be smaller for a larger reactor, right? on a per unit, uh, per megawatt basis, or a per megawatt hour basis. All else being equal, a larger reactor will typically be cheaper. And that's something which you're going to lose out uh, in case uh, you go to a smaller reactor. Uh, and uh, and I'll sort of come back to this uh, sort of empirical evidence for this kind of claim. Uh, but for the same reason, because you have a smaller reactor, it's going to be less efficient at doing some of, uh, some of the neutrons are going to leak out. Uh, that's what actually makes it in some ways better for safety. But it also means that you're going to produce more spent fuel. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Alison McFarlane, and her uh, postdoc, Lindsay Kroll, and Rod Ewing at Stanford have sort of done also other kinds of waste uh, or on top of what Alex said I did to show that actually you're going to be producing much more intermediate level waste and lower level waste from smaller reactors. The nuclear industry's answer to this would be to say, yes, we know a smaller reactor uh, is going to be typically more expensive. Uh, they will sort of push back a little bit on that, but we can sort of, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of that kind of debate. But what they would basically say is, we can compensate for that by building large numbers of these. Right? We will learn from our experiences and so on and so forth. Uh, there are sort of two problems with that argument. First is that historically, nuclear power is one of those technologies where costs have gone up with time. I already showed it uh, in the case of the United States from the Lazard figures. But this is a much larger sort of fleet level averages. And the two countries that have the most number of reactors, the United States and France, uh, those uh, figures show that costs have typically gone up. And you can, uh, you can sort of interpret that as showing that as you learn more from nuclear reactors, you realize there are newer ways in which they can go bang. And so then you have to have 
safety precautions added to it that's going to drive up the cost. It's one way to understand why these costs are going up. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is, I think France has a much more standardized design. Uh, and secondly, uh, France has basically one uh, government entity that's sort of doing most of these things, the EDF. Right? Uh, but the fact is, of course, this is still quite high. Right? And, and more important, the point is not so much whether it's lower or higher. If you look at nuclear costs in China, they will, of course, be cheaper than here. Right? Uh, costs of labor are less. Regulation questions are there. We actually, of course, don't have a lot of transparency. US is probably the one place where you have the most transparency in terms of costs. The other thing to remember is that even if you were to assume that there is going to be some kind of learning, you know, you, let's say you have like a 5% learn of, uh, rate of learning or even 10% rate of learning, you still have to manufacture these by the hundreds to the tens of thousands, depending on what you make your assumptions about how much you lose because of the economies of this economies of scale and how much you learn. Again, all else being equal, right? So these are who is going to pay for all these lost leaders in order to make small modular reactors competitive with large reactors, but large reactors themselves are not competitive in the electricity market. So this is kind of a losing proposition. The same kind of lo uh, losses of economies of scale will also affect operations cost uh, and things of that sort. Um, I'll just do a little detour to ask whether can small modular reactors be safe? Right? And by safe, I mean not susceptible to any kind of accidents that will release radioactive materials into the environment. So theoretically, there are good reasons to think that nuclear reactors are always hazardous. Uh, you know, it involves a hazardous process. These are complex technologies, lots of things that can go wrong, a lot of radioactive materials inside it. These are operating at high temperatures or high pressures. Uh, and in principle, large energy releases are possible. And last but not least, the time scale for operation for uh, different events there is set by the scale at which fission and, and other radioactive reactions happen. And that's a very short time scale. So things happen very, very rapidly. And uh, back in the 1980s, um, Chick Perro, the sociologist, um, wrote a famous book called uh, Normal Accidents, where he argued that the kinds of technological properties that uh, uh, nuclear reactors have uh, in particular, what he called interactive complexity, that there are different parts which interact with each other. So the number of ways in which things can go wrong becomes exponentially much larger. Uh, and uh, there's what he called tight coupling, that things happen in rapid succession. And these are inherent parts of a nuclear reactor design. You could sort of loosen the coupling, but then you it'll cost you money, essentially. So there are also optimization challenges and uh, conflicts between different priorities. Uh, the other thing which we've seen in the case of uh, safety claims, in the case of small modular reactors, large reactors, et cetera, is that uh, you know, there are mostly claims about not safety, but reliability, uh, which have to do with how, how much they expect things to fail. Uh, so the difference between reliability and safety is you don't think about the consequence in the case of reliability. You only talk about what's the probability that something is going to uh, fall. But the kind of data that we need to rigorously and uh, to uh, evaluate uh, these probabilities just doesn't exist. We don't have enough reactors out in the world, unlike, for example, airplanes, uh, because there are tens and thousands of uh, airplanes flying around each day, and you get statistical data from those things. So the ways that it can be, this kind of uh, uh, mathematical technique can be used to uh, evaluate the safety of airplanes simply doesn't work in the case of nuclear reactors. And then there are sort of also problems with sort of organizational conflicts. Who has the knowledge? Who is producing these claims? And how reliable these are? And also problems with the regulators and so on and so forth. The bottom line is that any claim you will see about the safety of these are inherently problematic, inherently sort of uncertain. And uh, so there is a kind of way in which you shouldn't sort of trust uh, risk assessments for these kinds of things. There are also problems, organizational problems having to do with nuclear authorities being overconfident, uh, challenges with regulation, regulatory capture, things of that sort, uh, priorities that are different for different countries. So for example, in China, the, uh, the leadership, the government sort of decided they're going to build up a large number of nuclear reactors. And that actually led to a lot of people in the nuclear industry being concerned about the pace at which these reactors were being uh, built. 
So all of this basically is to just say, whether it's a small reactor or a large reactor, the probability of an accident at a nuclear plant will probably always be greater than 0, which means that there's no such thing called uh, safe nuclear power. OK, so I'm now going to turn a little bit to what we know about small reactors. Uh, small reactors are not uh, really new. Um, the first set of reactors built in many, many countries would be small under the current classification of being under, under 300 megawatts. So this, for example, is the list of all the reactors that were built in the United States, uh, which are uh, technically under 300 megawatts of design capacity. Right? And you can see the quite a, a large number of these things. Uh, now, many of these were um, promoted by the US Atomic Energy Commission starting in the 1950s. Uh, and even earlier, there was sort of um, a, uh, the US Air Force, Army, and the Navy also sort of went into uh, building small reactors for their different bases and their submarines and so on. In any case, just to give one example, so one of the first ones that was built, and the idea again for many of these uh, small reactors that were built at that time was we want not just the large utilities, but also the smaller rural elect electric uh, cooperatives to be able to benefit from nuclear power. And so then you have to develop smaller reactors because their uh, demand base is much smaller. Right? And so this was promoted. This is a one called Elk River in uh, Minnesota, which was uh, promoted as being uh, rural America's first atomic power plant. It had a lot of the features that you see in today's SMR technologies. So it was, uh, you know, the people who were building it said, we can take everything by um, large trucks, essentially, uh, flatbed trucks. Uh, we can construct the thing on the site. Uh, we don't have to sort of, I mean, we can carry the uh, different parts and just assemble it on site, et cetera, et cetera. But this reactor, again, had all of the usual problems, construction cost overruns, time overruns. Uh, and then it operated for barely four years. And at the end of the fourth year, uh, there was one, uh, one equipment which failed. And then the utility said, it's not worth our money to actually fix this, uh, because it is not making a lot of money anyway. We are losing money operating this thing. So they just shut it down after four years. Um, and you can see the same kind of diseconomies of scale with the small modular reactor designs that are being uh, proposed today. Uh, the one that you know I'll talk a little bit more about is uh, New Scale, which is the only small modular reactor design that has been uh, licensed by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and there was a, a a proposal to build one of these in the state of Idaho. I'm happy to share my slides. Don't have to take a picture. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of go on and just talk a little bit more about delays. I'm, I'm really realizing that my talk is also getting delayed by all me, all my side uh, asides. <laughs> so um, they are also sort of ex uh, uh, exhibiting the same kind of patterns about delays, not just in the construction process, but even in the process of moving from uh, announcement about plans and designs to when actually construction starts. So the NRC, for example, in 2008, thought that there are going to be a bunch of reactors operating by the mid uh, of, the, of the first uh, of the 2010 to 2020 decade. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, there are still, you know, if you look around the world, there are extremely long delays. Uh, going from the point of you know, announcement to the point of even start of construction. In the two countries where they have built small reactors in Russia and China, uh, those designs did, didn't perform as they were advertised. Uh, the design in, in Russia is, a, uh, is on a barge, and that was about three times, it took three times as long, and cost about five times more, if I remember right. Of course, you know, in Russia, you're always skeptical about cost estimates. Uh, and in China, again, uh, what we know about it was that it took about more than twice as long, and the costs are expected to be about uh, two and a half times. So there's a lot of reason to think that we should be very, very skeptical of these things. So the question is, you know, if much of what I've been saying comes from historical data, why do we even see these kind of claims? Right? Uh, and uh, my friend Benjamin Sovakul and I sort of looked at this by uh, looking at uh, you know a whole bunch of uh, papers, technical papers, uh, and trying to um, see what else do they claim. So, these are, many of these are technical papers about 
you know, the design of a control rod or some completely you know, uh, arcane technical topic. But they will always start the introduction with some grand claim, right? some reason for doing why, why we do this work. Uh, now, one thing, obviously, is going to be climate change. But what we did was actually systematically go through a whole bunch of them, about 60 of those papers, and see what are the visions that were imbued in them. And we, we kind of tabulated five different visions. The first is you know, what we called a vision of risk-free energy that would eliminate the possibility of any kind of catastrophic accidents. Uh, second is sort of remote communities being energized by these reactors. Third is uh, the use of nuclear power to produce water uh, by desalinating, right? Four is, you know, you're going to have no waste, no carbon, uh, ways of generating electricity. And last but not least, some of them will talk about how you can use this for space exploration, right? This is, you know, this is kind of the fewest thing, but I see this often in comment sections below my article. In fact, I wrote one last week and saying, explaining why this is not going to work. And one person says, oh, maybe there's going to be a place in space exploration. And if you're going to set up space colonies, you may have to build small modular reactors. All I can say is, good luck. You know, please go there, and I'll give you, I'll give you $100 to buy a one-way ticket there. <laughs> um, so why, is, why are these visions? We argued that the main reason that these visions are being uh, postulated today is to sort of, A, attract political and financial support. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And uh, also to erase older uh, failures of nuclear power from uh, discourse. And I think the, this is a cartoon that many of you might know, uh, where Charlie Brown goes to kick a football, and Lucy sort of uh, removes it. And uh, that's, I think, the kind of metaphor that fits very well uh, with this. And so in this, given this uh, alternative, there are only basically two different kind of strategies you can use. One is to say, you know, just believe us, right? This is going to work this time, right? Or it's going to be, you know, yes, we know we failed, but someday we are going to succeed. So until that happens, please keep, keep giving us money, essentially. These are the kind of two different advocacy strategies that you see quite often. And last but not least, there's actually now this great opportunity for these, uh, for the re nuclear reactor vendors pro provided by climate change, right? And you basically see all kinds of people, including people like Bill Gates, uh, who are sort of funding small amounts of money for this and then saying, you know, their nuclear reactor design is going to solve the problem for all of us. Uh, Bill Gates is probably the most uh, prominent of these people because he wrote a book a couple of years ago saying, you know, how he's going to solve climate change. Uh, and then went on a big talk show uh, 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 trip sort of promoting his technology and his vision. Right? OK, so I'm going to sort of end this uh, by asking the question that you know, many of us get asked, uh, including me for sure, uh, whether we should expand nuclear power to solve climate change. Um, so I think I would sort of divide my, I mean, no guesses, no, no prizes for guess my, what you think I'm going to say. I'm going to say no. Uh, but uh, I would sort of divide my answer into two, uh, at least two sets of uh, reasons. Uh, the first is uh, the question of feasibility, right? Uh, so the, the two, there are sort of at least two challenges we have with nuclear, with uh, dealing with climate change. It's actually a much bigger challenge. I don't want to get into that at this point. Uh, we can go into in the Q and A. But one is the qu question of urgency and time, right? And every a report that comes basically says we need to act now, we need to reduce our emissions fast, and so on and so forth. How does nuclear power fit into this? The answer is not very well. Right? Um, I've sort of talked a lot about delays and so on. If you look at uh, reactors being constructed around the world, uh, the latest update for the last uh, set of reactors that were built in the last decade is that the average time is about 9.4 years. Right? Now. Uh, that is between, that's the time it takes between going from the point of uh, pouring concrete on the ground to when it starts supplying electricity to the grid. Now, there's a much longer period before that when you have to get the appropriate environmental permits, persuade some community that it is OK to live near one of these facilities, which might go bang, and you may have to leave your houses never to come back. And last but not least, raise the billions and billions of dollars you need to build one of these things. right? And you know, in countries like China and so on, it's different because the government sort of uh, backs up everything. These are uh, state-owned enterprises. It's a very different game, but it's very different here. Right? And so you'll see the big differences there. But in general, you should 
assume it's going to be a long period of time. So British Columbia, where I live in Canada, if the province were to decide tomorrow that they are going to build a nuclear power plant, then it'll be 15 to 20 years before the first unit of power is going to flow out of that, of that uh, power plant. Right? So that's the kind of time scale you should be thinking about. Uh, and on paper, these things look great. Uh, you know, For a long time, uh, the Westinghouse Corporation used to have a little uh, computer-generated video on their website that showed you know, different blocks sort of coming together like Lego blocks, you know, month one, month two, month three, and then after uh, around 36 months, the reactor would be ready to go. But in reality, it took about three times as much time. Uh, these are the reactors that are being built in the state of Georgia, uh, and the second of those reactors has still not yet gone critical. So what works on paper or on computers doesn't work in the real world. Uh, and more generally, if you look at uh, the United States in the mid uh, 2000s, uh, after the 2005 Energy Policy Act under the uh, Bush administration, uh, around 30 reactors were ordered by uh, utilities around the country, uh, of which and 15 uh, large reactors are expected to go into power into uh, start operating by 2021. And actually, only four of those went to the point of construction. Of those. Two of them uh, were abandoned. This was in the state of South Carolina. Over $9 billion was spent for essentially what's a big hole in the ground. Uh, and the people in South Carolina are still paying for that. They didn't get a single unit of electricity from that. And the last one that is being left is this one in Vogel in, in Georgia, that whose costs went up initially. Uh, the, when construction started, it was expected to be $14 billion. It went up to $35 billion. But if you actually go back to when the Energy Policy Act was uh, enacted in, in the 2004-2005 period, you go to the Senate testimonies and so on, Westinghouse officials, you know, Nuclear Energy Institute officials were saying, it'll cost about $5 billion. Right? So it went from that to about three times that before construction started, and another two and a half times that uh, of the construction start cost. Uh, same story in the UK. Uh, the one plant that is being uh, operated is, or is being constructed is in Hinkley Point C. That's now expected to cost $59 billion, uh, which is, makes probably the second most expensive building in the world. Um, uh, and you know, again, there were all these plans for how many reactors would be operating by 2020. EDF famously said, the chairman of EDF said, you know, by Christmas 2017, you'll be roasting your family's turkey dinner on electricity from Hinkley Point. That, of course, didn't happen. So you know, I think the way to think about it is, uh, my friend Amory Lovins wrote in one of our uh, nuclear industry status reports. You know, we should think about uh, cost and time and carbon, and nuclear fails on at least two of those counts, right? So it should not be considered to be a solution uh, to climate change. And then there are all the sort of usual desirability problems. The risk of accidents. I've sort of argued that you cannot sort of escape that. They are. It's deeply uh, uh, intertwined with. Uh, nuclear weapons, and there is no uh, proven, demonstrated solution to dealing with uh, to nuclear waste at this point. Uh, and you have to sort of remember, while solving, trying to solve the climate crisis, you shouldn't make other crises worse. Uh, so this is the latest um, uh, announcement about the doomsday clock from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. You may recognize one of the people there, uh, and uh, you know I think. One of the things they emphasize is the risk of nuclear war. And expanding nuclear power is only going to make that worse. OK, I'll stop here. I've already sort of rambled on for quite a long. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. I can run this, yeah. Intimidate people into asking me questions. <laughs> yes. In something with the slides, you went over it too quickly, but that's something I don't fully understand. I'd like you to comment about it, which you had said before. As to the hurting of safety of the small reactor. Yeah. And that the, that the community of scientists of small reactors are going to argue that we can get rid of the zone by the year. Yes, EPZ, in a, in emergency planning zone. And, and that seems like really kind of, kind of pathetic that they're. Yes. Yes. And public opinion is going to get. Can you, can you, what is this about EPZ? 
Yeah. Um, so I think you, you use the word pathetic, and I think that <laughs> it describes it quite well. Because if you think about the cost, so the main reason, one reason they should be thinking about reducing the, so just to uh, explain Rob's question. Around any nuclear reactor, there is a zone, uh, which is called the emergency planning zone, a few miles that is outside of the plant, where the community is told that you know, in the event of an accident, these are the steps you have to take. Right? And they go through these drills every couple of years. Uh, in Canada, where I live, for example, people who are there are entitled to uh, potassium iodide, which is a, a thing that you can uh, intake in case there's an accident to prevent iodine from uh, radioactive iodine from accumulating in your thyroids. Right? So anyway, so there's an area that something has to be done. Uh, the best estimates we've seen for how much this costs it's like five to ten million dollars. Uh, this is just to make sure there's the a, a, a year. Yeah. Okay. So it's a fairly small amount of money that can be saved. So why is the why are they sort of putting on such a big deal about it? I think there are sort of a couple of reasons. One is the cost, and at this point they are economically not viable. So any penny they can save is a penny that they are, they would like to save. But the other argument is they want public perception to change. And they would like to say, these are so safe, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has agreed they're so safe that it can be anywhere you want. And if you read some of the, uh, the, sort of the publicity blurbs, as it were, right, you will see uh, the uh, vendors and, and people from those companies talking about how safe these are. You know, it's like a crock pot in your kitchen. right? It just sort of, that's a molten salt reactor. And something else is, you know, it's like this, it's, it's meltdown proof because the thing is already molten, so you cannot melt down anymore. It doesn't mean that there's no radioactive material that can come out. Right? So there's a lot of ways in which they try to assure the public that there is no danger to this. And they see the restriction of the EPZ to within the site boundary as the official premature of that. So I think that's the reason that I would say. But really, this is a question that you have to ask them. Right? I can only sort of imagine what's going on in their heads. Had a question over there? These are loaded questions, and they take a long time, I think. Let me start with the last one. And there are people in this audience who probably know much more about the IPCC. But I don't think the IPCC sort of advocates for nuclear power. Their reports look at all the published literature, and they summarize that. right? And yes, there's a lot of peer-reviewed literature that says that nuclear energy is a solution to climate change. There's also a lot of peer-reviewed literature, including mine, that shows that it's not a solution to climate change. Okay. The IPCC will look at how many are there, and there's a lot more funding for nuclear engineers to do this kind of work and make these claims. Right? But if you dig deeper into that, the IPCC doesn't go dig deeper to see what are the kind of assumptions they're making. How many dollars per kilowatt are they assuming in their integrated assessment models to make these kind of predictions? And if you look at it, there's a huge split between reality and what kind of assumptions they make. Okay, so that's that question. Come to India, and I mean, uh, second question about sort of natural gas. Yes, natural gas did play a part. In, in what happened in the United States. But 
there is also, I'm not comparing it with natural gas. I'm comparing with renewables, right? And the costs there have plummeted. These are, the, globally, this is the cheapest, including in China and in India, right? So in India, for example. China has to build the renewable power plant. And they have to build the renewable power Yeah, but that's, so you have to understand why that's happening, yeah, right? And, and so. Yeah, No, 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 it's not. I'm not playing the whole this thing. But you have to sort of ask the question, why are the Chinese building it? Why are the Indians building it? And the answer has to do with sort of the, the political economy of the institutions that are running these things, right? So in China, for example, there are two large state-owned enterprises, CNNC and CGNPC, which have a lot of uh, influence, right? So when uh, you know the Prime Minister of India or Xi Jinping wants to go look for advice on what to do, or what to lose, they're going to turn to people who are in their ministries. And if the Ministry of Energy is dominated by people who are, in building, who are interested in building nuclear reactors, they're going to build those things. It's not as though they're sitting and doing a very transparent exercise and saying, we looked at all the costs. We decide this is the cheapest. Therefore, we're going to build that. Right? You have to look at a little bit about the, you know, understand the political economy of what's happening. Right? And, so, and last but not least, look at all, all of the numbers that you look at. You talked about India being cheaper. Cheaper than what? Right? Nuclear reactors in India are extremely expensive, right? And you've seen even in the parliamentary reports claiming that. They still say, well, we need to build nuclear power plants, but they're not going to say it's going to, it's cheap at this point. Following up on the sort of comparability, comparing renewables and nuclear, um, talk a little bit about land density. Um, that's something that gets brought up by the industry some, um, and it is definitely true that on a land density basis, nuclear mm -hmm. takes a lot less land than renewables. Um, countries like Bangladesh, long-term planning, which is a few sort of um, lower-income countries, uh, like sort of smaller, not smaller, not exactly, but that are really pretty intensely to really build nuclear projects in part because, you know, maybe it's just an incredibly population-dense country that doesn't have the space to sort of build out solar and wind. In the U.S., 15% of U.S. counties have passed ordinances banning solar or wind in their territories. There are more, last, in this past year, there were more counties, twice as many counties that Introduce ordinances banning wind in their territory as, mm -hmm. as, inter as getting new wind projects in their first and second year. So, obviously, to say that sort of nuclear is a winner on public opinion and local feelings is a bold statement. Um, on the other hand, I'd be curious whether, like, what do you think about those land density discussions? And in particular, uh, in areas uh, where there are, do you see patterns in resistance to nuclear? where basically some of the areas that in the US say that resist solar and wind might be more open to nuclear, um, where like basically these are correlated, where nuclear could be a solution in some geographies that don't feature solar. So big, these are big questions. Um, I don't know if I can address all of them, but I'll try my best. Uh, so first, I should say one thing which I didn't respond to in, in Rob's question about the importance of public opinion. Right. So the nuclear industry does think public opinion is important enough to try to influence it. But they are also very happy to work around it in as many ways as possible, right? Otherwise, there's no reason they should have persisted with this Yucca Mountain project uh, to uh, uh, put out a radioactive waste. Um, and I wish public opinion mattered more. I wish uh, energy policy making was done more in a democratic way. It's not, right? Uh, it's really a lot more powerful interests that drive any kind of policy, right? And we've seen this in, in so many different things, uh, including, you know, there's a lot of research from Princeton itself that explains how, you know, decisions in, in Congress are uh, driven by all kinds of other interests, right? Uh, so that's there. Now, is there uh, resistance to renewable energy politics? Absolutely, right? There is re resistance to nuclear? Yes. Now, how do they correlate? That's a good question. I haven't seen any studies that look at that, but I've seen studies that try to understand uh, people's uh, opinions about climate versus nuclear, whether nuclear can be a solution or not. And one uh, sort of generality, I mean, these are very difficult to make generalizations because each population you study is very different. Uh, but one generalization that some people have made is that at best, people who are concerned about climate change have a reluctant acceptance of nuclear. Right? They still see radioactive waste as a problem. They see some of the other safety challenges and so on as problems. But they will say, you know, if we have no other choice, then maybe we should build nuclear power. Right? Uh, but if they see there are other choices, they may not have that kind of support. And that's the second point. Third thing which you see, I think, in some of these studies is that uh, you know, a lot of work 
uh, among people who look at uh, public attitudes towards risk in general, uh, look at underlying values that drive these things. So the Yale group uh, you know, has been doing a lot of this uh, kind of work. And uh, what they see is there are, you know, they classify people into different kinds of people. You know, there's a well-known sort of uh, white male effect uh, where you know, there's, uh, they are more uh, blasé about various kinds of technological risks. They are less concerned about climate change. Uh, and so that's a population that you see is generally supportive of nuclear power. And there's a lot of these kind of funny correlations, if you like. So the concern about climate change does not overlap very well with acceptance of uh, nuclear power. I'm just going to summarize a very complicated landscape uh, in a fairly simple manner. And lastly, you know, in terms of uh, land use and you know, Bangladesh and so on and so forth, definitely. So the, the question is, uh, you know, should countries build nuclear plants or not? That's a very specific question that each of those countries have to be ma making. The question that you can also ask is, is that going to help you with climate change? Right? That's a different question. Right? And so, and the other assumption here is that you know, all these countries will have to generate all the energy themselves. And that's a, it's, a, uh, it's a political determination that they make. Do we want to be importing energy or not? Is that a political determination. It's not a necessary that all your power has to be generated in the land that you have. Zia, and the person in the back. Aspect of the way that you presented this is to deem within domestic national processes and comparison between countries. Can you say a little bit about, um, and that was implied in the question over there, about how China is seeking to export reactors, the Russians are exporting reactors, the South Koreans are exporting reactors, the US used to export reactors, and, and so on. And so I'm just wondering how all of this process changes when somebody from somewhere else is coming to build that reactor, mm -hmm. and in some cases now saying, we will give you money to pay that reactor, so you don't actually have to worry about the upfront investments and capital costs, because you're going to pay it back you know, from day far off in the future. So that seems to be part of the story that is you know, cutting across some of the points that you made. Maybe you just expand on that a little bit? Sure, excellent, yeah. Um, that's a great point. I sort of I've thought about it in the past, but didn't, not in the last five minutes. Um, so, if you yes, the uh, around the world, um, the country that is building the most number of nuclear reactors is Russia, and they have two big assets uh, in this uh, in the in the reactor export model. One is that they are able to provide cheap finance. So, in all of these projects in Bangladesh, in Egypt, in Turkey, uh, all of these places, they have given somewhere between 80 to 100% in the case of Turkey uh, of the cost of building the reactor. Right? And uh, in Turkey, it's a build own. Uh, so they're going to own the reactor that they build, and they will sell electricity for the first 15 years, and they'll recoup their money that way. And then eventually, it passes on to the Turkish. Uh, and in other places, they give somewhere between 80 to uh, 90, 95% of the cost. Uh, and so then, once that happens, Again, political uh, scientists have looked at this in a number of large projects, including high-speed rail. So uh, China and Japan have been competing all over Southeast Asia uh, to build these projects, so high-speed rails. And what typically happens in these cases is once there is an external source of funding and an external player, the so number of domestic players who like latching onto that. This is a possibility for them to get big contracts, so then they become supportive of that. Right? So the reasons why they decide to go into these projects have to do not just with some objective set of here's our energy demand, here's the cheapest way to uh, generate it, but have to do with a whole bunch of other political and economic factors. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And the other thing was, I was just curious about the economy, I mean, just talk about the economy, the scale, and the reactor. We saw about the record, the entire talk about like moving the economy at the scale to the manufacturing process. That, of course, requires like a strong product pipeline. Because same thing with, like, for example, solar. If you're going to build a lot of these model technology, you need a strong demand pool with like, a huge market price that would like, supply a certain degree of factories where you can achieve these economies at scale. Also, if you look at that, for example, the economy is a verification tool. Because like, the idea with all these products all around is that a lot of that money is coming from financing costs. Because while the product, while the construction period is spent like five years to 15 years, you still have to own interest. So the idea if you're building these things in manufacturing in factories and then like shipping the passenger a little bit faster, then maybe you can cut on that risk too. I mean, because like a lot of the stuff that you're going to are like first of a kind products, which is like you're still not really tapping into these economies of certification and first of a kind. Of always like problems that plague the like cost of runs and like delays. So what are your thoughts on that too? It seems like it's trade off between economies of scale and the production versus like that. Okay, sure. Yes, yeah, the second question of the MRV and then we'll have to wrap up. Do you have a question? Go ahead and ask. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious if you could also comment just briefly on the INL collaboration with Terra Power and I, it's my understanding that they're using HEU um, in like more of a research capacity and that won't be what's commercially available or anything but like the proliferation risks associated with endeavors like that. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about that offline. Uh, it's uh, yes, that's an issue. Uh, they have to use highly high SA, low enriched uranium, and uh, there's that makes it much more proliferation risky. But we can talk more about that later. Uh, I'll briefly respond to your two questions. Um, uh, first, about uh, the uh, yeah, one is the the problems with the sort of levelized cost. Yes, I agree that it is just one metric. Uh, I don't think there's another very good metric for system level things. And that's because of a, of a sort of fundamental reason. If you are trying to construct a grid uh, and, and reliable electricity based on a number of different renewable technologies, what is going to be making sense will depend very much on geography. right? So how it works in British Columbia is not going to be how it works in New Jersey. right? And so that's one thing. So and second point to remember is that reliability is a system level property. It's not a property of an individual power plant. Any, any reactor, any power plant will have to be shut down at some point right? for refueling, because there's a safety problem, because the coal supply doesn't come in, whatever it is. Right? Or everything, like in France, for example, in the last few years, the average nuclear plant has been, in 2022, was down for 152 days, right? because there's a generic safety problem that afflicts a lot of those reactors. So, you have to ask the question, how does France do it? And then, of course, France imports power. right? Uh, so anyway, so there's, a lot of, uh, there's no one good metric. right? But if you think about it, if you want to build a, a nuclear plant to complement uh, a, 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 a fleet of uh, uh, generators which are primarily renewable, and so they are subject to when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining and so on and so forth, your nuclear, and if you build enough of those solar and wind, which is because it's the cheapest thing, that's probably what you will do, then your nuclear plant is going to be supplying power for maybe 30% of the time, 40% of the time, in which case the power, your uh, cost of energy from that is going to be more than double, right? because the same costs are being split. The second point you mentioned about uh, factory manufacture and so on, again, we've seen this happen in the case of uh, you know, the AP1000s. And what basically happened was all of the problems that used to happen at the construction site went back to the factory. right? And yes, you know, if you have if you build a lot of these things, you will iron out some of those problems. But you're still going to be building things which are going to be very, very expensive. And so, who's going to pay for all that extra cost? That is the question. There's a chicken and egg problem there. Anyway. Sabrina, last question. Oh, sorry, yeah. So you you just saying that there's no safe nuclear power, but you also talk about economics and you know, sure enough, the new scale project is selected by the NRC and sort of got all of this regulatory was canceled because of the cost. Um, and I think sometimes these claims about the safety of nuclear power, whether by academics or by you know, climate activists, can really stoke public fear about nuclear power and about nuclear war, which you know unnecessarily so. But they also make sort of this nuclear waste process and trying to solve that problem much more difficult because now there's this really heightened level of fear among the public about just nuclear in general. And it's, it's making this public perception problem that much more difficult. And so I think, you know, what do you think about some of this um, academic work that it kind of makes these claims that you know all nuclear power is dangerous and how that kind of stands up the public? And do you think that this is a solution to that problem in public perception? Um, so there's 
So there are two questions here. Um, one is, you know, is it fair to make a claim that all nuclear reactors are capable of accidents, which will release radioactivity? And I think the answer is yes. Okay. Now, should that knowledge be kept away from the public? Should they be told no? You know, there are some reactors from which no radioactivity will ever escape. I think that's that would be uh, dishonest, right? Now, if you want to say I want to build a nuclear power and I want to somehow persuade the public that it's okay to build, then you know certain kinds of knowledge you should keep it away from them. That's I think the what you're sort of getting at. But I think this is also leading to that question of like risk and how to perceive risk, right? Just because all nuclear power plants may be capable or are you know, capable of releasing radiation, right? All nuclear power plants release radiation in some degree. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. Yes. And so it's communicating to them what that level of risk is, and it's sort of saying all nuclear power is dangerous, is maybe you know, not communicating that level of risk. So the claim that it is safe means there's a zero percent chance of uh, accident. That's what I would interpret safe as, right? The industry says that all the time. So you should be complaining to them to say, no, you should not say that. Well, I anyway. remember at least one meeting. Mm -hmm. You just have to get used to them. You have to be sort of manageable uh, and sort of work with that paradigm instead. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and so sort of throwing this out there. But I think I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, let's um, have yeah. another round of applause for. Thank uh, you. Thanks for coming.